Well, hello there, everyone. My name is Amy. This is the Penny Woman, and welcome to Crafty Reads, the series where I craft something and I talk about the last five books that I've read. Um, these five books are from the beginning of my Quailet Readathon. Um, these are the first five books that I've read. I'm not sure how many more books I'm going to be able to squeeze in, but five down uh, so far. We'll see how many more I get to go. Um, this week, I am not working on my crochet. I finished my cardigan. That video is coming. Don't you worry. Um, I'm working on this little book. I am. I showed you a few uh, crafty reads ago. I'm working on putting different uh, backgrounds on each of these pages, and then I'm going to go and do an individual two-page collage across each page. Um, so yeah, that's what I'm going to be working on. Let's talk about some books. Okay, so I started my Pride Month off with a book that I've been anticipating for a long time, and that's The Natural Mother of the Child by Chris Malcolm Belk. Belk. <laughs> Sorry. Chris, Chris Malcolm Belk. Chris Malcolm Belk. Um, this is a book that I struggled to find here. Um, I ended up getting it from the UK and getting it sent to my mom. Um, or my mom grabbed it for me, which was very nice of her, um, because, yeah, I couldn't find it anywhere. But it's basically a set of essays... Basically, it's a memoir in the form of a set of essays um, about non-binary parenthood. Um, Chris Malcolm Belk is trans mask, um, and he has three boys. He's married to a woman. She had uh, a cis woman. Um, she had the uh, first two children. No, she had the first child and the third child, and he carried the um, second child. So he obviously wanted to go through this process of becoming a parent. And that's not something that every trans mask wants to experience. It's like what a lot of people avoid, I think, quite actively. And obviously, when you've got two um, AFAB people, two people who have the parts to make children, um, it's definitely a uh, concerted effort to make a child. It's very expensive. You go through a lot of the process. So he obviously very much wanted to be um, the birthing parent at some point. And I think this book is just a wonderful look into a completely different type of family unit than, than we're traditionally um, exposed to. Um, I mean, how many, like he, one of his kids even says, like how many kids can say that their dad grew them? You know, like that's insane. Um, and it talk, he talks about all of the complications to do with that. Um, the doctor's visits, the, the dysphoria, the, the, physical changes that were, you know, very converse to the way he was feeling on the outside and the way he was presenting. Um, his writing is so approachable. It's so easy to flick through these essays so quickly. It feels like you're having a stream of consciousness moment with him as he's telling you different stories and different anecdotes that happened throughout his life, throughout his pregnancy. It doesn't dwell too much on the pregnancy itself. It's a lot to do with being a parent afterwards um, to Samson, the son that he gave birth to, and to his other two boys. Um, it's, it's just so perfectly done and so easily absorbable that like I feel like so many people could learn so much about a different, you know, a completely different time. I mean, I'm cis also. Like, I learn about the experiences of um, people in these situations, especially as a person who doesn't want to be a parent myself. Um, it's so wonderful to see into somebody who has a completely different life to mine and how society affects them. I just thought it was absolutely wonderful. Then I read what was is probably one of my favorite books of the year so far. Um, there's two of those in this, this uh, video, just to spoil a little bit. And that was An Ordinary Wonder by Buki Papillon. Um, this is a story about an intersex twin. Um, two twins were born, one was assigned female at birth, one was assigned male at birth. But Otto, who was assigned male at birth, um, has some very, like his intersex qualities um, are external, like you can see them um, from the outside. It's not a hormonal thing, it's not um, something that's uh, internal. Um, so, his parents from the very beginning know that there's something different about him and they treat him as such. They treat him incredibly badly. Like he goes through a lot of abuse. He gets called a monster. He gets called a devil. You know, they're very religious. Um, this is set in Nigeria, by the way. Um, they're very religious and 
they just see him as like an abomination. But all through that, Otto still somehow manages to keep his like spirit that he's got. He's got such a clear idea of the girl he really is because he has been assigned the wrong gender. Um, and he he's so sure about who he is, even when he's not sure about what the word is for it. And he still manages to keep that up and that's and his spirit up throughout this whole experience. And it's absolutely wonderful. Like the character you're just rooting for the whole time. All you want is for Otto to be okay. And there are a couple of characters in here that are just perfect examples of like a, a better faith in humanity, people being open-minded, people being accepting of who you are. And it was heart-wrenching but it was utterly beautiful and i can't believe this is a debut it's written fantastically well and it shows you know a side of something like being intersex that a lot of people don't know anything about and i i just thought it was absolutely perfect it also got a little bit of african mythology uh, flung in there um he sees this mermaid being um when he's in times of stress and i really like how that was interwoven i absolutely recommend this book to no end oh my god then i read one i didn't like Ugh. so <laughs> for the queen of readathon i had to get a host recommendation and the thing with the hosts that are that run it like they're wonderful they do a great job like definitely go follow them um, go to the Queer Lit uh, Readers on Instagram, I'll link it down below, you can find all the links to the hosts there. But either I was finding that I'd read the books that we had in common, or I didn't enjoy the types of books that we hadn't read, so like I didn't have certain books in common with them. Um, but what I did find was Kings, Queens and Inbetweens by Tanya Bortishu. Um, and unfortunately, this one did not work for me at all. Um, <laughs> we're following a main character called Nima. She's a um, <clears throat> mixed race um, girl living in... Oh, I can't remember where. I can't remember where she lives. Um, in America somewhere. <laughs> and she knows she's queer. She has like unrequited love for a best friend of hers, which is how we sort of start the story. But then at a carnival one day, she ends up in a drag show. She's never been to a drag show before. And she's utterly entranced by it. And she catches the eye of a um, drag king. And she falls absolutely head over heels for this person. Like, she's so intrigued. And from there, she, like, gets more enveloped into the drag world. Um, unfortunately, I wish that it had gone down the road of... Um, what's that? It's over there. Black Flamingo by Dean Atta. Or, um, what's the one by George Lester? Boy Queen. Boy Queen by George Lester. If it had been something like that, I would have really liked it because I've read drag books, but most of the drag books are about drag queens. And I'm really interested to see the drag king side. Like, it's something that would be very intriguing to me. <clears throat> but I feel like this author picked like every idea that she could have it almost feels like her concept list like what she's decided she might put in this book and instead of picking a few and really flushing them out well she just um she half asked like most of it um i don't feel like anything was properly resolved to a point like Yes, the drag thing does become more prominent towards the end, but I feel like it was only in the last hour and a half of the audiobook where we really got a look at the whole drag situation. Um, I just feel like she tried to do way too many things. Like there's one, there's two points that I thought were going to be really significant and really impactful. Neither of them were brought up more than like a handful of times and they were never resolved. Absolutely never. It was so frustrating. And by the end of the book, I was just, I couldn't wait for it to be over. It was just driving me around the bed. So, yeah. It was, it, it's, it's, I, I don't read YA very often anymore. And it's got to be really good YA for me to enjoy it. And this was not. So, yeah. Oh, well. <laughs> Can't like them all. <laughs>
And then the book that everyone has been talking about, every fucking sapphic on TikTok talks about Delilah Green Doesn't Care by Ashley Heron Blake. Um, I only tend to read queer romance now. It's very rare that you'll find me reading a straight romance because I really couldn't give a fuck. Um, so this is just, uh, it's a cute and nothing revolutionary. It's just a cute, fun romp of a romance that's sapphic. There's two women, a bisexual and a lesbian, who fall in love. And sometimes that's all you really want. And I think this is what, that, that's what this series is. There's two more books after this. Um, and I feel like that's what the series is. It's like really, it's like a, a fun little entertaining romp that's like got a good amount of humor in there. It's got some fun characters, but it's nothing too uh, over the top. It's nothing too revolutionary. You know, there's a third act conflict as there always is. Um, but let me tell you what it's about. <laughs> so Delilah Green grew up in a place called Bright Falls. Oh, this is really awkward. Jesus Christ. <laughs> Amy, what have you done? Uh, hang on. Mm. Mm. Okay, so she grew up in this place of Bright Falls, and her dad died when she was very young, so she grew up with the stepmother that she didn't really like, and the stepsister that she was kind of distant from, called Astrid. And now, as soon as soon she got to 18, she left and she became a photographer. Now she is coming back to Bright Falls to photograph her stepsister's wedding at her request. She's getting paid for it. Um, and she runs into Claire, who is a friend of um, her stepsister's, who she's always had a little bit of a, a thing for. And a spark flies and things happen. I can't really tell you much else because it's a romance and I would completely spoil it. But basically, Delilah is there to take photos across a two week period of um, uh, wedding events that are happening. So there's a lot of forced proximity. There's a only one bed trope that happens at one point because a lot of the stuff taking place, like Claire is there and so is Delilah. Um, and it's super cute. I really liked Claire. She's a single mom. Um, and I thought, like, yeah, the ragtag group of characters was fairly entertaining. And I think if I see, maybe in the sales section of Bargain Books, if I see Astra Parker doesn't fall or Iris Kelly doesn't date, I will pick them up. Even though Iris Kelly doesn't date, is not out yet. But uh, when it eventually does, if I'm in the mood for a romance, I know Ashley Herring Blake is a good place to go. I've got to sit up a bit. My butt has gone to sleep. Oh, no. Oh, oh God. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> okay, we've got one more book to talk about, pals. One more book, and I finished it this morning, and that is Last Night's Telegraph Club by Melinda Lowe. This is another one that is on my favorites of the year so far. Um, this book is a perfect little snapshot into the 1950s, being queer in the 1950s, and being a person of colour in the 1950s. We're in, we're like nine years, nine to ten years after the war is finished. Um, and we're following Lily. She lives in Chinatown with her family. Um, she's a, she's Chinese American. And she has this group of friends that are all like from Chinatown. And she has a best friend called Shirley, who's very domineering. Um, but they've been friends for forever. So she sort of like puts up with it. Um, but Lily has... Lily has big dreams. She wants to become a, she wants to go to space basically. And she meets this girl in her maths class called Kath, who wants to become a pilot. And they're very intrigued by each other, even though they haven't um, like really gotten to know each other properly. But Lily all this time has been thinking about, um, she's been trying to figure out her sexuality. She's really got the feeling that she's into girls and it's, it's quite hard for her um, because, you know, it's the 1950s. These things aren't accepted at all. Hello, Bob. Welcome. Welcome to Crafty Reads. This is Abby. <laughs> yes, sweetheart. Um, so, yeah, Lily has this um, cutting that she got from a newspaper or something of this, um, or a flyer, I think it was a flyer. Um, of a male impersonator called Tommy Andrews that plays at, uh, that has a show at a club called the Telegraph Club. 
And one day that slips out of her bag and Kath picks it up and she sees it and she says to Lily, well, I've been to the Telegraph Club before if, with one of my friends if you want to go. So even though it's unspoken at that point, you they know that the other one is queer. And I think it's such a revolutionary thing for Lily and they end up going to the Telegraph Club. I don't want to spoil anything else that happens, but... Um, the, in the background, there's also a lot of like the Red Scare happening, especially in the Chinese community because of China being a communist country. There's a lot of people under suspicion in the Chinese community. So that's another like, uh, <clears throat> like point of contention that's happening. But because it's the 50s, because of their culture and because she's a good Chinese girl. Do you know how many times that term gets used for this poor girl? A good Chinese girl that is so much pressure like she needs to be a certain way because that's the way Chinese girls are especially in America for the Americans to take them seriously like this is the way they need to be they can't like Chinese girls aren't like that like there's so many times where it's just like so blatantly wrong and she she's just looking for a place to be able to be herself and to have people who care about her regardless of her sexuality and I think this is a really good snapshot into being queer in the 50s and being a person of color and all of the stress that that entails um like I know a lot of us are sick of seeing queer trauma in um so many books but unfortunately I think because this is a historical fiction there's not really a way for there not to be trauma involved but there's a lot of queer joy in here and I feel like it ended off really well um, it also brought me to tears a couple of times, so there's that. <laughs> but with that, that is the end of our crafty reads. I've done a few pages, some spotties, some blue, some more spots, a bunch of cool stuff. So, yeah, thank you for coming with me. My leg is well and truly asleep. Um, if you'd like to see what I've been really wanting more in depth about what I've been thinking about these books, you can check out my Quillet Readathon vlogs. I'll be linking them down below. <gasps> a mouse bird. There's a mouse bird in a tree. Okay, there's two. Oh my god. Come down and eat my seeds. Anyway, um, if you want to watch those vlogs, they're all on my channel. I will link them down below. Um, and go follow my social media. My TikTok is super fun. My Instagram is full of gorgeous book pictures, if I do say so myself. Um, but yeah, if you enjoyed that, like, comment, subscribe, all of that fun stuff, and I'll check you next time.